Welcome to Sunday Online. My name is Reg, and it's my privilege and pleasure to be with you today. If you're new to London Riverside Church, then why not go to our website, fill out the form, I'm new, and one of the team will get in contact with you. We're going to have some time of worship now, so let me encourage you to stand up and let's worship King Jesus. Trust the sweetest thing only Jesus. Christ alone, a cornerstone, the weak made strong in the same.
So good that we're able to worship Jesus. And in a moment, we're going to receive our tithes and offering. And if you call London Riverside Church your home, uh, the ways in which you can give into the house will be on the screen. And then we're going to watch Church Life now. My name is Paige. My name is Deborah. And this is Church Life. Coming up this week is Connect Group Week. It's a great place to get to know people and to really help grow your relationship with God. If you're not part of a group already, head over to our website or go to the info point after the service. As we heard on Vision Sunday, our church is growing. So we are now moving to full services from the 31st of March. The times will be on the screen. Make sure you pick one and come on down. We'd love to see you. Coming up is our baptism service. It's gonna be held on the 24th of March and the baptism class will be on the 3rd of March as well. So if you would like to make a public declaration to show your love for Jesus, make sure you head over to our website to sign up or go to the info point after the service. That has been all from us. Yeah. See you guys next week. Have a great week. Bye. Bye. It's great that you're with us online. Great that you're here as well at the 8.45 service. So, uh, fantastic. Uh, we're going to continue our series today called Stand Strong. And uh, I, I don't know if you've realized this. If you're a parent, you would have, you'll definitely know this. If, or maybe you've observed this. But children have an instinctive trust of their parents. It doesn't always last through life. But when they're born, <laughs> when they're born, they have an instinctive trust. It's like, uh, yeah, well, basically, when, you're really, when the kids are really small, dad can do everything, knows everything, is a complete superhero without a cape. Then they grow up a little bit. <laughs> they realize dad can't really do everything. Uh, but there is this instinctive trust. And one of the ways that, that is expressed, it was expressed in my home as my kids were growing up, all three of them, I hasten to add, is they would like to jump from any great height and expect me to catch them. Okay, and some of you have been in that kind of situation. So that means when I got home, there would be a kid on the stairs waiting for me to catch them. Okay, and it began on steps two and three, and then it gradually went further and further. And have you noticed, if you're a parent, or you've ever done this, that the kids have far more, more faith in you than you have in you? <laughs> but you can't let on. You can't let on that you're a bit worried, right? So they go up another step. Yeah, go on, jump. I won't say the names. not going to embarrass them. No. Jump, jump. And they jump and you catch them. And then they run back up and they go another step. And it's like, oh, I think the last one was probably, you know, you know when you caught them, you, it was kind of heavy. And, <laughs> and, and so it goes on and on. So that, all, all three of my kids, they just had that trust. They, they'll jump and you're going to catch them. And I, you know, I can say it now. I'm no way if they try it now, am I ever going to go try to do that. But it's like, there was times when I thought, mm. <laughs> I'm a bit nervous. One time, actually, my daughter, who is now grown with her own children, but she, uh, she, we were on a street late in the evening. Uh, we'd been out with some friends, and we're walking down the street in Vienna, and she ran up behind me and shouted, Daddy! And then I turned around, but she had already jumped. And she had jumped with a little bit too much space between us. My daughter landed on the floor at my feet. Okay, parent fail, I'll tell you now. Amazing the trust that she had. She was okay, don't worry, nothing serious, nothing serious. But you see, we have this instinctive trust of our parents. We have this faith, as it were. And, and you know, that is what faith in God is like. Faith in God is simply trusting in the character of God. We know he'll catch us. We all know he'll be there. He's better even than your own parents because he will turn around in time and catch you. There is a complete trust. There is a reliance on him. That is what faith is. Some people say, well, faith kind of, sound, kind of sounds complicated. It's not complicated. It's simply trusting that God is who he says he is. It's simply trusting that when he says he'll be there, he will be there. Trusting in his character. 
So as we've been looking through this series in Ephesians chapter 6, we've been looking at the fact that life can be a battle at times. Ephesians 6 verse 10 says these words, Finally be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. So we are encouraged from the scripture that life will have difficulty, that we will face attack, that we will have to deal with difficulty and temptation and all kinds of trouble that might come our way. But it says here we can stand strong. It says to be strong in the Lord and take your stand against the devil's schemes. Now, we've explained this each time, but I'll just, if you're catching up with us today for the first time in this series, Paul the Apostle is writing these words to the young church in Ephesus because he is actually under house arrest. He's actually probably a guard is in the house where he is. A Roman soldier is there. And so he gets this inspiration as he's writing under house arrest that we can actually put on the armor of God. We've already spoken about the belt of truth, the breath plate of righteousness, the shoes of the gospel of peace. Great word last Sunday, by the way. If you missed last Sunday, catch up uh, online with that. So today we come to verse 16, Ephesians 6. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Stand strong with the shield of faith. Is what I want to talk about today. Now, just to explain, the shield of faith, the shield that the Roman soldier would have, it was not like a little round shield, like kind of so big that they would hold in their hand like that. No, what Paul is talking about is a shield which is more like an oblong shape. It's actually almost as big as the person. It's a huge oblong, uh, almost to the ground shield that they would carry. This is made of two sections of wood. It's covered in a coat of, uh, uh, covered in leather. Because these flaming arrows that the Bible talks about there, or if you're King James, uh, the fiery darts, okay, these arrows were dipped in pitch and they were lit and they were then uh, fired towards uh, the enemy. And so what happened is when the arrow uh, hit the shield, the shield was made in such a way that it would extinguish the flame. That was important. It wasn't just about deflecting. It was about extinguishing the flame that had been thrown at them. And let me just say here that some of the arrows in life, they can't be dodged. They have to be blocked. We'd all love to dodge. Oh, this sounds bad, but we'd all love to dodge our way through life, wouldn't we? <laughs> we'd like to dodge our way through past the, the flaming arrows. We'd like to dodge our way through all those circumstances. But the scripture is clear. Sometimes you can't dodge the situation. You've got to block it. You've got to block it with the shield of faith. And a shield that has seen some action is not the prettiest shield. So let's not judge. Let's not go by appearances. Some people have a shield of faith that's seen some action. And you say, well, I, mm, I don't know. We're so used to, uh, with, with, our, with our social media and everything else, everything being pristine and everything being so presentable. I don't think the shield of faith is all that presentable, friends. If it's seen some action, it's going to have some holes in it. <laughs> it's going to have some places where the leather is not as good as it looked before. But the shield of faith is so important in our lives. We need to activate our faith because not everything can be dodged. Some things have to be blocked by our faith. And like I said, faith is trusting in the character of God. It's that total reliance on him. In Matthew chapter 8, we read this story, actually regarding a Roman soldier, a centurion. It says, when Jesus, Jesus, verse 5, when Jesus entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? Matthew 8, verse 5. So the centurion comes to Jesus. He says, Lord, will you heal my servant? And so what happens is uh, Jesus is actually willing to heal him. Jesus is not checking his credentials. He's not checking if he's been to the synagogue because he wouldn't have been to the synagogue. He's not checking which God he's been praying to because he's a Roman centurion of a different faith. But he sees something in Jesus and he says, would you heal my servant? You know, sometimes we do too much, check, we, we check up too much before we pray. <laughs> oh, I'm not sure. Sh- let's just make sure this prayer is worth it. Let's just make sure. Now, I know you wouldn't say that, but it's going in front of our heads. Will this, will this really happen? Does this person really believe? Jesus said, do you want me to come and heal him? 
And the centurion replies in verse 8, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. Just say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself are a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes. I tell this one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. Friends, the centurion had recognized something that the religious leaders had been missing all along, that God is willing and he is able. The character of God, which builds our faith, because faith is trusting in the character of God, God's character is that he is willing and he is able. Now, some people are willing but not able. We all know what that feels like, don't we? Okay, the heart's there, but we don't have the means. Other people have the means, but they're not willing. Our God is willing and able. That's his character. And that's how we approach him. We ask in faith. And so the centurion says, you just need to say the word, Jesus. You're in charge. You are able and you are willing. You just need to say the word and it will happen. In the verse 10, it says, And Jesus heard this. He was amazed. It takes quite a bit to amaze Jesus, by the way. Jesus was amazed and said to those following him, Truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. Oh, man, he was really winding up the, the religious leaders, the leaders of Israel, the leaders of the faith. And Jesus says, I have, This centurion, he, 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 this is something else. He's grasped that I, who I am, that I am both willing and able and I have the authority to speak the word, to speak the word in any circumstance. Verse 13, Jesus said to the centurion, go, let it be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that very moment. Can I encourage us to take up our shield? Take up our shield of faith. What are you asking Jesus for today? Ask in faith, what word does Jesus need to say over your circumstance? What word does Jesus need to speak into your situation? The centurion's faith was such that he knew that God was both willing and able. If you just say the word, it will be done. Friends, that's exciting. I don't want you to be shy about this as you're thinking this through in your heart, as you're considering what is the word that Jesus needs to speak? They say, but I've asked him before. I think there needs to be faith in our hearts today. We can ask him again. What is the word that Jesus needs to speak? So faith is trusting in the character of God, that he is willing and able. Now I want to jump to another story back in the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 22. We read in Genesis chapter 22 that Abraham, some of you know the story, God promised him a son, and it took a long time coming, but there he was, he had his son Isaac, and he, uh, God says to him, take your only son, whom you love, and sacrifice him. Now, hands up straight away. Uh, this is a little bit alarming, okay? Let's just sort of brush over this. Oh, it's a Bible story. We, we teach it in Sunday school. Friends, we're teaching this in Sunday school. This is freaky. Go sacrifice your son, okay? Let's just be real here. This is a, this is, I mean, if someone comes to me on Monday morning and says, Pastor, I've heard from God. <laughs> right? <laughs> okay, let's not even mention social services. I'm just like, I'm just, I'm just concerned, okay? This is weird. This is alarming. This is culturally difficult to digest, okay? So let's just say that. But let's just walk through the story a minute and see what God's trying to teach us. So, God says to Abraham, the son, the promise that had been so long in coming, but now he was there because the son, it wasn't just that he would have a family, but the promise was that this family would bless the nations, that he would be a father of nations. So this was kind of important. You've got the one son, and now he's no longer going to be. So God, it says here, asks him to do this. And Abraham is trusting in the character of God because God is good and faithful. So something in Abraham's heart knows God's good, and he's faithful to his promises. So whatever this weird request is, there's going to be a different outcome. He knows in his heart. He knows in his heart. He has faith. And so the story says that he sets out and on the third day of traveling with his, with his servants as well. On the third day, it says in Genesis 22, verse 5, he said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship 
and then we will come back to you. Yeah? We're going to go over here and worship. We're going to make a sacrifice. He's got all the gear with him. And we will come back. So this is the faith speaking. This is faith speaking. Because he knows that God is good and faithful. You see? So although it's a weird situation he's walking through, it's a very strange, obedient act to, to work, walk towards, he knows that God is good and faithful. And so as they're walking up the hill, up this mountain, Genesis 22, verse 6, and this breaks your heart when you read it, the, the, Isaac says, Dad, the fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? No, the sun's clock, you know, what's going on? We've got, we're going to make an offering, but we don't have an offering with us. And Abraham says these words in verse 8, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And so the story goes that he starts to build the altar. He grabs his son. He starts to prepare his son to be on the altar. And then an angel calls out and tells Abraham to stop. And says, I've seen your obedience. And there is a, there is a ram stuck in the thicket in the bush. And, and so there is, God has provided. And so the, everybody, okay, cool, that's good. Because the Bible is going to get really dodgy then. And, 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 and it's all good. It's all good again. But you see what happens here. Hebrews 11 explains it like this. That Abraham did these things by faith. By faith. Trusting in the character of God. You know, when we obey God, we do it by faith. If we obey by any other means, it doesn't please him and it doesn't do us any good. It's by faith that we follow his word. The shield of faith that we use to extinguish those flaming arrows is one where we trust in the character of God. Now let us just look in for a little moment here at what these flaming arrows are like. Because these flaming arrows, we experience in life, are not a new thing. They've been around a while, ever since the beginning of time. What are you saying? Well, let's go into Genesis, but let's go back to chapter 3. Okay? So in chapter 3, we've got an amazing story of where Eve is speaking to a snake. I told you we've got one weird story. Now we're going weirder, okay? So Eve is having a conversation with a snake who personifies uh, evil, it personifies the devil. And so she has this conversation which actually leads to mankind's ruin. Mankind's ruin. What happens in the conversation? Genesis 3 verse 1. The serpent says, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? You know the first flaming arrow that we all experience is doubt. You see, bear in mind we raise our shield of faith to, to doubt. Okay? Doubt creeps in. Maybe what Adam told you, you've misunderstood it. Maybe Adam misunderstood what God said. Did God really say that? Did God? Maybe you've got this wrong. Maybe this faith thing, you've got a bit too excited about it. Is that really what you're supposed to do? Is that really what it's all about? We've all had the doubts, friends. We all have the doubts. And you never get beyond doubt. Let me just say that. You never go beyond a place where there's not a, a flaming arrow of doubt that might turn up. And you need the shield of faith. The character of God. I know he's faithful. I know he's good. I know he's willing. I know he's able. Did God really say and so the woman replies in verse 2, the woman said to the snake, we may eat from the fruit, uh, eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. And so the serpent replies, verse 5, uh, sorry, verse 4, you will not certainly die, the snake said to the woman. Now I put here, that not only doubt, but doctrine. Okay, doctrine is basically our teaching. The teaching of the truth. What happens is that, that the other flame and arrow that often comes in our lives is the attack on the doctrine. That won't happen. You're not going to die. Uh, don't worry about That's just the detail. Don't worry about the detail. That's not what it really means. You know, you've read the Bible and it says, and you say, and somebody, ah, oh, no, but that's not what it really means. Oh, that was for them then. That was, that was way back. We're more advanced now. That doesn't apply to us anymore. He's tracking with me? A flaming arrow of doubt or of doctrine? I say, oh, that, was, that, was, that was then, but that doesn't apply to us now. That followers of Jesus then, it was kind of different to how people follow Jesus now. You're not going to die, the snake said to the woman. And then verse 5, now he comes in for the big, the big arrow. <laughs> for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good 
and evil. So first we've got doubt, then we've got an attack on the doctrine, and then we've got division. Relationship is questioned. If God's a good God, I think he might be keeping something from you. If God is faithful and, and just as you say he is, I'm not so sure because he's keeping something from you. He's, your life is not complete until you've tasted this from this tree. Why is he keeping that from you? Is he not like you? Is he worried that you're going to be like him? And so he's not a good father. The character of God is challenged. These are what the flaming arrows are like in our lives, friends. They haven't changed since the beginning of time. They haven't changed. They're still the same, that we have to lift the shield of faith and extinguish that flaming arrow and say, no, my God is a good God. That is what he said. His word is true. I know that he's for me and not against me. I know that he's not keeping something from me. I know that he has my best intention at heart. You know, the division with, with God but also becomes division amongst ourselves. And that's one of the greatest schemes there is, isn't there? If we can be against each other instead of about the task that the Father has given us. Even the first followers of Jesus were having a few fallouts about who was better, who was greater, who was this, who was that, who should get this seat, who should get that reward. You know, we need to watch for these flaming arrows. You know, the Roman soldiers, they actually used their shields in quite a clever way. They had what's called a turtle formation. If you see the next slide, you'll see what I mean. That they actually had a way in which they would join their shields together in order to protect themselves from attack. You know, friends, when we talk about putting on the armor, it's not just about your walk with God. It's about our walk with God. When we talk about taking up the shield of faith, it's about us taking up our shields of faith. There's times when actually you don't have the strength to stand, but someone else will stand next to you. Is that right? We, some of us in the room, we know what that's like. You can't even utter the prayer, but someone's come alongside you, lifted their shield, and they're praying with you. Is that right? So let's recognize here that, that, that there's something that we do together. We stand strong together. We don't allow the division to enter. We don't allow even that misunderstanding or the breaking down of relationship which would cause our faith to stumble. No, we stand strong. We lift our shield of faith, even against those lies and those, uh, that deceit. Forgive whenever we can. Let me just tell you, the simple way to do it is just forgive. Paul actually says in uh, 2 Corinthians uh, 2, you can look at this up in verse 10 and 11, he, say, he says these words, Anyone you forgive, I also forgive. And what I have forgiven, if there was anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake. In other words, Paul is saying, even if I miss something, I forgive. <laughs> even if I didn't realize that I needed to forgive, I want to forgive. I want to have that attitude that does not allow the enemy any space in my life. I'm going to hold the shield of faith and I'm going to forgive. I'm going to extinguish that arrow. In order, verse 11, it says, that Satan will not outwit us, for we're not unaware of his schemes. And so there is the shield of faith. Now, what I'd like to do uh, this morning is just briefly touch on the, the next verse, in verse 17. Because in verse 17, uh, we're encouraged to not only take up the shield of faith, but also to take the helmet of salvation. Take the helmet of salvation. And Paul is referring not only to the, the guard that's maybe in his house, but also to the language of, of, of Isaiah in the Old Testament, the prophet, who speaks of a heavenly warrior, warrior who is Jesus, who will bring salvation. It says in Isaiah 59 verse 17, He put on righteousness as his breastplate, and the helmet of salvation is on his head. And that helmet of salvation is ours, friends. It's ours to take the word take here, to take the helmet, it's not just like find one and grab it. It means it's been offered to you. The armor bearer has offered you the helmet to put on. And so we are to take, in a sense, that taking is actually receiving what God has provided. Receiving his salvation. Putting it on. Knowing that it's not more than a ticket to heaven, friends. Our salvation is not a ticket to heaven. Our salvation is eternal life now with a future fulfillment. But it's for now. The helmet's for now. It's to wear now. You know when you're about to pray for someone and you get that thought, I don't, what right do you have to pray for this person? 
Who do you think you are praying for them when you haven't prayed for? Am I the only one? Has your pastor got troubles? You know when you're about to do something, you're following Jesus and you think this is the right thing to do, and then you get the thought, how can you do that when you've done this? I'm just saying it for you. I'm not going to fill in the gaps. You can do that yourself. Okay? But you know what's, what's said. You know what you say you tell yourselves, but often it, we're told. You know, the Bible simply says that the enemy is a liar, is a liar and an accuser. And we have to recognize that, friends. That's why we need the helmet of salvation. To recognize, no, I do have the right to pray. I do have the right to walk the way that Jesus has asked me to walk, to do the things he's called me to do. Jesus says in John 18 that when the enemy speaks, he he lies, he speaks his native language. He speaks his native language. Yeah, that's what comes all to... Oh, we've all got our native languages. My native language got really confused living abroad for 15 years. So sometimes I think in the language different to the one I need to be speaking in. Uh, Anyway... (laughs) But he says here that the, the devil himself, he, his native language is to lie. He's a liar and the father of lies. Friends, we have to recognize that because thoughts come and we need that helmet of salvation to assure us that that's a lie. You have every right to pray. You have every right to follow Jesus. You have every right to give and invest in the kingdom of God. You have every right to go for that job. You have every right to raise your children in that way. You say, yeah, but in the thoughts, oh, yeah, but I messed up and I didn't do this. And I did. No, you have every right. You see, our salvation is past, present, and future. Our uh, past is forgiven. Is that right? Our past is forgiven. You need to tell, and someone said this before me, that when the enemy reminds you of your past, you need to remind him of his future. Because your past is dealt with. Jesus has dealt with it. He says in Acts 10, verse 43, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Everyone. Even those of us that don't think we've got it together. Everyone. Everyone. Even those of us that missed church last Sunday. You know, because we think there's a kind of thing to stay Christian, you've got to do certain things. No, no, we don't have to come to church. We get to come to church, right? We know that. So, when he says, well, you, well, what, what, do you, what do you think you're doing? What about this you've done wrong? It's forgiven. Yeah. Our past is forgiven. Our present has purpose. John 10 verse 10, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I've come that you may have life and have it to the full. Not when we get to heaven. Now. Now is life to the full. Purpose now. Our present has purpose. And then we have a hope. For the future. Remember, your salvation is not all about the future. Your salvation is now. Your past is forgiven. Your present has purpose. And your future has hope. Let me finish with this verse in 1 Peter chapter 1. It says these words, In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, a living hope, and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. So there is a sense, and as we walk through this life, our past is forgiven. Our present makes sense. Our present actually has purpose. But we know our salvation will one day be complete. In other words, it is complete, but we will live in the completeness of it. It says here that we have a living hope because Jesus is risen from the dead. We have a living hope. Even when we face death in this life, there is a living hope that there is an inheritance that can neither perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you. Isn't it amazing that we can live with that confidence? with the helmet of salvation on our heads, not to listen to the lies and the accusations, because they will come. Sometimes they come from voices you didn't expect to hear them from, but they will come. You need to remind yourself, I live in God's salvation. My past is forgiven. My present has purpose, and my future has hope in Christ. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation. I'd like to pray for a moment. I'd like to encourage you to stand with me. Because I'm believing as we pray now 
that a word will go out into our situations. That we can maybe come like the centurion this morning and say, Lord, just say the word. Just say the word over that circumstance. Say the word over that sickness. Say the word over that need of provision. Say the word for that guidance that is needed. I encourage you to close your eyes, kneel, stand. If it helps to lift your hands, just an attitude of prayer at the moment. Let's receive as we come to our Father. Father, we thank you for the shield of faith. Lord God, I thank you that you have equipped each one of us to extinguish those flaming arrows, to extinguish those doubts and that division and even that wrong thinking and and doctrine that may be coming towards us. Thank you that we can lift up that shield. And so, Father, we come knowing that you are good and faithful. We come knowing that you are able and willing. And so, Father, now, as we seek your face in this room and those that are joining with us online today, as we seek your face, Lord God, we ask, would you speak the word into that situation? Lord God, would you be glorified in that life? Be glorified in that circumstance. We come and ask in faith today, knowing that not only are you able, but you are willing. Speak that word, Lord Jesus, we pray. We thank you for healed bodies, for right minds, Lord God, for your provision, for your timing, we pray. We thank you in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's lift our voices, shall we? Let's lift our voices in in worship to him this morning. Thank you, Gail, for that message. I trust that for you, this was inspiring and encouraging as well. And maybe there was something in the message that maybe wanted you to commit your life to Jesus. Then let me encourage you to repeat these words after me. Father, I thank you for your son, Jesus. I thank you that he died, rose again, so that I can have a relationship with you. Uh, God, I pray that you help me be the person I'm supposed to be. I'm sorry for the things that I've done wrong. Holy Spirit, come into my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you said that prayer, we are so stoked and happy for you. Uh, go to our website, fill out the next steps page on the next steps page, uh, and would love to walk you through the journey of what it means to becoming a Christian. Uh, don't forget, Easter Sunday, we are going to four services in person: 8:45, 10:15, 11:45, and 1:15 here at our Dagenham location. It's going to be absolutely fantastic as we celebrate King Jesus. Uh, have a fantastic week. We'll see each other soon. Bye.